Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation, the podcast that explores the reality of a word in danger of losing its meaning altogether. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Lewis Gum. Lewis is president of Cambian Solutions, which focuses on excellence in innovation, business growth, and team performance. Earlier in his career, he led award-winning mobile businesses at The Weather Channel and CNN. Recently, he has served as CEO of two digital media firms and led the advertising division of Cox Communications. He is also the author of The Inside Innovator, A Practical Guide to Entrepreneurship. Lewis, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited for this conversation. Thank you, Jared. It's great to be here. Oh, fantastic. Well, let's dive right in. What, to your mind, is innovation? Okay, I'd like to answer that question in the context of entrepreneurship. And the definition of entrepreneurship is the practice of creating value through innovation and growth within a larger organization. Mm -hmm. So creating value is important as an entrepreneur. However, there is something distinct about that in comparison to innovation alone. And also growth comes along as a separate concept. Innovation itself, in my mind at least, it's about creating something new and often in a new way. Mm. As I was doing a little research for this gathering, I looked at the root for innovation, which is innovare in Latin, mm -hmm. which is to renew. And I thought that was very interesting. That is interesting. Because it's one thing to talk about something that's brand new and has never been seen before. It's another thing to expand the time horizon. So you look not only forward, but also backward and realize for years, for decades, for centuries, and even for millennia, people have been renewing. And so we're finding ways to express ourselves, to adapt as time rolls on. And I think all that is part of innovation. Oh, well, that's so great. I love it. The entrepreneurship concept, we will definitely come back to and talk a lot about because I know you and I have deep feelings on that topic and you have deep expertise on it. So I can't wait. All right now, I want to poke at that definition of innovation that includes renewal. I'm really excited about that. When we think today about innovation, to your point, most of the conversation is about the future and what will happen next and what will evolve and grow and change in the future. I think honoring, understanding, and recognizing the past is a core piece of innovation. So I'm excited to hear you talk about that. How does the past relate to thinking about the future as it relates to innovation? It's so fundamental that it's hard to get to the bottom of the relevance. Mm. If we think about it, we are where we are today because of what came before us. Mm. And what came before us in some period of time came after some period of time before that. If we think about this in the context of innovation, you can go back to, let's just pick a time, the creation of the television. Mm and then the rollout of television. You look back before that, the creation of the telegraph. Right. And the telegraph led to the television, which led to other forms of video. You could argue the computer, et cetera. Go back before that, the printing press. Go back before that, paper. And so we're learning from those who came before us. And we owe, in some respects, a very significant debt mm. to people who have helped to pave the way. Wow, that's so well said. And I love the examples you chose because when you think of television and the fact that it built on the technology of Marconi and the telegraph and that whole thing and the ecosystem that had to exist around, it's not just about creating this signal and sending it out. Someone has to have something to catch it, right? And someone has to have a place for you to generate the signal, which is where NBC and all of the broadcasters who used to be radio now moved into this new space of television. And so there are so many elements that go into innovation. I think the historical context you highlight is particularly important now because I feel like that is getting compressed and overlooked quite a bit as internet silicone-based technology starts to step to the forefront of what innovation is. Whereas in the past 50, 100, 150 years ago, it was much more mechanically driven even some of the social aspects of things were a bit more forward in the definition of innovation. And I wonder, as we think about history, is there a lesson to be learned from those examples as we think about the way 
folks are organizing around things like AI, LLMs, GPTs, things like that. How do we translate the lessons of radio and the telegraph and paper into this modern definition of innovation? Well, I think there are many lessons to be learned. And just to pick up on what you said, for example, let's look at the microchip. Mm. And then let's look at, there are physical goods, but there are also protocols. Let's say HTTP, you can talk about the creation of the World Wide Web. Mm. You can look at what happened then with websites. You can then look at what happens with websites on desktop computers. You can then look at what happened on mobile devices, which is one of the waves that a number of folks that I'm familiar with have excelled at. Right. And now you look, for example, at AI. And so there are several aspects of this which leap right out. One of them is the amount of time that passes sometimes between cycles is shortening. This has been pointed out in a number of places. In the past, it might have been 5, 10, 20, 50 years. Mm. But now we're seeing changes that can happen in significantly less time than that. Right, right. Another one is we're building on what came before us to a point that came up a bit earlier. And if we honor that, if we say, wow, there's actually a lot good about that, if we understand the context in which it was created, and then we move from there, that gives us some pretty good guideposts, maybe, for what we're going to see ahead. Mm. And also, in my experience, just about any major wave in technology results in change that is generally positive and also watch areas, things that cause concern. Right. And so I think there we need to both tap into the many positive things that happen and also be conscientious and diligent and intentional and ethical as it comes to any of the challenges and make sure that we build that into our thinking and action. Ah, so well said. And action. That's, that's very well said. Thank you for making that connection. It's an important one. And I know it was kind of embedded in your point, but I just really wanted to get your thoughts on how that sort of plays out in today's world. So thank you for sharing that. Back to your point about entrepreneurship and that as kind of a different ecosystem for innovation. Tell me a bit more about what makes entrepreneurship different. Well, there are several things that make entrepreneurship different from entrepreneurship, Mm -hmm. and it helps to start with the definitions. As I mentioned before, uh, entrepreneurship is the practice of creating value through innovation and growth within a larger organization. Entrepreneurship tends to be the practice of building, and it's for someone who either starts something or owns it or both, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Those things are part of the traditional definition, and often that person has taken on a substantial amount of risk, uh, more than many other roles that someone could take on in the process of doing it. And so with entrepreneurship, you get some of the pluses and minuses that naturally flow from those different types of roles. With entrepreneurship, you have, for example, typically a larger scope and scale of an organization. Mm -hmm. You have more processes. You have more resources. You sometimes have barriers, but you also have resources to draw on that entrepreneurs would love to have. So it's a real mix. And ultimately, it's helpful for each of us to have some self-awareness right? and to say, hey, am I more naturally wired to work well in an environment that has characteristics of entrepreneurship, or am I more naturally wired to excel more in a place that has more characteristics of entrepreneurship? And one other thing that I would add there is that I don't believe this is monolithic. It isn't we are this or we are that for many of us. Mm -hmm. I see. If you have somebody who says, I hate having a boss, I want to do it my own way, and I don't get along with other people, you probably want to do something other than entrepreneurship. (laughs) If on the other hand, you say, hey, I always like being surrounded by a team. I like contributing to a larger mission. I like having the resources. I like the risk mitigation, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You might naturally be wired to be an entrepreneur. Some people are many, uh, all their careers. And then there are some people who can move fairly fluidly from one to the other. And there are at least two paths that happen here. One is a person who, let's say they come out of school and they want the relative security and the excellent training that comes with many large organizations. Mm. They get the training. And then when they've come along a ways, 
they say, okay, now I'm ready to go out and do something on my own, if that's what they want. Sure. On the other hand, some people will found a company, they have all the energy, they have the ideas. And then at a certain point, either through acquisition or through intentionality, or they have more family obligations or whatever it is, they say, I want more security of this larger organization, relatively speaking. Everything carries opportunity, everything carries risk, but it's, it's a relative scale and then you can choose. Mm -hmm. I love the idea that it's not monolithic. And I think that's very important. It's not an attribute of a person. It's a set of circumstances and situations that come with resources, come with challenges, come with opportunities, and you don't have to be locked into one or the other. As you were describing that, it really also jumped out at me as we think about a few years ago, post-pandemic and some of the other things that were going on in the world, when the uptick in entrepreneurship and people going out on their own and starting their own business and doing these other things. I don't think entrepreneurship, to your point, is for everyone. And sometimes I worry about people leaving corporate roles for entrepreneurship to solve a different kind of problem, not the problem that you just clearly laid out. This is what I want to do versus that. This environment isn't right for me, or I believe that I have this idea that I can turn into a business. And this is not a well-formed question, but I feel like there's an opportunity for companies to better educate their employees on entrepreneurship, what it is, how it works, and that it's an opportunity within the company. Because I feel like people are choosing between standard static corporate job and entrepreneurship when there's another option. Does that make sense? It does. I agree with you. There is an opportunity for companies to educate employees. There's also an opportunity for companies to create an environment where entrepreneurs feel welcome and successful, mm. which is done very unevenly. Yes. As it relates to the first point with educating employees, in some respects, it starts with knowledge of the definitions of knowledge, what you're dealing with. For example, I'll sometimes see people say, hey, act entrepreneurially within a large organization, which is both well-intended and also directionally helpful. Right. However, it comes with risks. It does. You and I were chatting a little bit before. How often have we seen someone who really wanted to act entrepreneurially within a large company? You try to transplant exactly the same behaviors and then you run into a brick wall. Mm. And some of those things are completely preventable. Mm -hmm. You just need to understand what you're dealing with and adapt the style and understand how to be effective with these really talented team members. And so if companies were to do a better job of educating, here's what it is, here's how it works, here's how you can be successful and make those distinctions, I think they'd be doing themselves and a lot of team members and probably their customers some real favors. Mm. Secondly, creating an environment where entrepreneurs can be successful. Because if you have a company that, let's say it's growing three, 5% a year, it's a pretty healthy company, and you just want to keep it going and you're trying to work on the next quarterly numbers or whatnot, there are a lot of ways to make entrepreneurs feel like they're essentially speaking into the wind. Sure. Oh, I have this great idea. Sorry, it's not our priority right now. Or if you do have a great idea and everybody agrees that it's consistent with the priorities, sorry, we don't have a budget process or come back to us in two years or whatever it is that seems challenging, especially when that very same company is saying it wants to innovate and has a need to do that to serve its own customers. So it's in everybody's best interest to set up processes and structures so that emerging businesses, emerging ideas, and general innovation is welcome in its own way, even as you're managing to deliver for the operating business in a way that is very high quality and high reliability. Mm. Yes, that makes so much sense. From my experience, I've heard phrases inside of companies like off-brand or off-equity as reasons for not doing things or not exploring things or not investing in things. And it, it feels like a form of dismissal of entrepreneurship. I think there's an element of almost tissue rejection, organ rejection, that comes along with building a company around something around an insight, building a company around a technology, building a company around a consumer benefit, things that don't naturally and immediately and obviously align with those things, it can feel like 
to a leader of a company, a CEO or a general manager, I'm making tough decisions. I'm doing the right thing. I'm protecting the brand. I'm protecting our equity. I'm protecting our positioning in the industry. And I can imagine to an entrepreneur, it could read differently. Is that a fair way of thinking about it? A hundred percent. And that's where there's responsibilities in at least a couple of areas. One, the company needs to both express and the leaders in the company need to express what the strategic guidance, the strategic priorities are for the organization mm. and also create a path for new ideas to percolate if they want to be most successful. The entrepreneur has a responsibility, a team member has a responsibility to understand those priorities and then be looking for ways to advance the needs of the organization. If we're a shoe manufacturer, just to pick one, and somebody comes up with a great idea, it was National Hummus Day recently, so uh, you know I, I have an idea for a new type of hummus. It's like, well, great, but might not be the best one here. But if you're a shoe manufacturer and you come up with a new way to lace up the shoes, maybe that's something that should be entertained. Mm. And then once you've found that strategic alignment, it helps to find an advocate. I've found some people can make a decent amount of headway on their own. Right. But in a larger organization, it's very, very difficult to take an idea all the way home unless you find other people who are supporting in various parts of the organization, even when you're not in the room, mm. saying, you've seen what this person is talking about. She's got an amazing idea. You ought to listen. And here's why. Mm -hmm. And I want to acknowledge, and this is one of the difficult truths about it, some organizations just aren't all that receptive. You got this really creative thinker, this exploratory person. Typically, these types of people want to create value. They want to contribute. They want to make a difference. And if you get shown the hand enough times, at a certain point, it might be worth saying, hey, maybe there's another place that could use your talents more effectively if you're going to be making the kind of contributions that you want to and if you want to be fulfilled. So I want to emphasize there's responsibility to go around. Oh, for sure. That's such an important point. And I love that you balance it in terms of there's responsibility on both sides. And that's one of the unique aspects I'm taking from what you're saying of entrepreneurship versus entrepreneurship, where you don't have to make that balance. If it's your company and your business and you're an entrepreneur and you think you're making shoes this week and you think you should make hummus next week, you can decide to make hummus next week. And so that feels like one of those elements of entrepreneurship that is unique. And also I hear in what you're saying that it might not be that entrepreneurship isn't for you. You might be an entrepreneur in the wrong company. So when great ideas get shut down like that, I think that's one of those moments where they go, oh, well, I'll start my own company. Whereas if you can understand the hallmarks of a company that has more of a mindset of nurturing and fostering entrepreneurship, you might not have to go out and do the entrepreneurial thing. You can work on problems and solve problems within another company. A hundred percent. I found that repeatedly in my research. And I just heard too many stories about people who found the right place. The image that's coming to mind right now is if you have a beautiful plant, you want to have it in the right pot. Right. And if it's too big or too small or you name it, might not fit right. But a lot of us can find homes where we can be very, very effective. Another thing that came up in my research is that this isn't limited to for-profit organizations. Mm. I was talking with a friend of mine, John Hancock, who is CEO of Junior Achievement of Georgia, oh, wow. amazing organization and part of JA Worldwide. Yeah. And as we were talking and I was interviewing him for the Inside Innovator, he said, you know what? This sounds like me. It sounds like JA. And then he told me a story about how JA BizTown developed. And that's one of the conversations that opened my mind to the idea that, hey, this happens in a lot of places. It's not just the private sector, but it's also charitable nonprofits, mm. education, government and beyond. So there can be entrepreneurship and innovation in a lot of places. Hmm. That is such an important point. And it goes back to, and I know you're, you're way more familiar with this world than I am, but the world of media and what gets elevated through mass channels as innovation. And it's usually technology-driven innovation personified through a person. So it's Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg or whomever, Jeff Bezos. 
And I think there are so many other forms of innovation, so many other avenues for innovation that don't always get the same level of attention. And that is a perfect example. I think there's more innovation in a lot of ways in charitable organizations and social sector and public sector than in others for resource constraints create a need for innovation. And I think sometimes it's even more prevalent in those places than in some of the places that get labeled as innovative places. Oh, you're getting me all fired up, Jared. (laughs) I completely agree with you. Technology-driven innovation is very, very important. Mm -hmm. It often bubbles to the top because it's, in some respects, easier to see and you can point to some type of engineering or some type of breakthrough. There are all sorts of reasons why this happens. And I've been involved in a lot of those as well with really talented teams. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you can have innovation in the way you serve a population in a charitable nonprofit. You can have innovation in cooking and restaurants that has zero to do with technology. For example, if you want to innovate and you don't know where else to start, just go cook an omelet. Just figure out what you can put in an omelet. Really. And hopefully it'll taste yes, good. Maybe it won't. Such, but right. if you cook a Nutella omelet, I haven't tried that, by the way. I don't know whether it's good or not. But you try a few things, you get the wheels turning. It's amazing what you can create. Right. By the way, I, I might stick with spinach and mushrooms for now, but maybe there's a different way to cook the omelet. Yeah. <laughs> so there are all sorts of ways to innovate. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You could go down the path of other fungi, other greens yep. as a incremental innovation until you decide to go out on a broader tangent. Yes. No, it sounds like we're in violent agreement on that. And it's one of those things that I think cuts everyone off from lessons. There's no place to go learn innovation. There's no place to go sit down and read this book and you've learned innovation. You have to get out and see things and experience things, things outside of your domain. And I think the more we label this is innovative and not that, the narrower our education becomes on what innovation is and could be and will be in the future. Because we are, to your point, we're living the history of the future. And if we start to cut branches off the innovation tree, that's just going to set us up for a more limited view in the future. Well, that's right. If we take your metaphor of a tree, then it's important to acknowledge that there are different sizes and scopes of innovation as well. Mm -hmm. Some of them might be a tree trunk. Some of them might be a big branch. Some of them might be a small branch and some of them might be twigs. Some of them might be leaves. Right. But you can have all sorts of innovation. Some of them are breakthrough. Some of them are significant, but maybe short of something that completely changes the way a whole lot of people do things. Some of them are very small and incremental. Even those on their own can create a lot of value, but especially when you have a habit of that, when you build it in systematically, it's amazing what you can do over time. Sometimes a lot of smalls adds up to a large. That's very true. Very true. Now, these insights around entrepreneurship and how it relates to entrepreneurship, how it relates to innovation, I can hear that it's core to what you do and how you think and see the world. What prompted you to sort of codify that and spend the time and effort and energy to sit down and and write a book about it? Well, thanks for asking. It really was because a bunch of people I knew and I were in this role of being an entrepreneur. Mm. I was responsible for mobile at the Weather Channel. I was responsible for mobile at CNN. I was working alongside people at places like ESPN, Verizon Wireless, Qualcomm, and other places. And I saw all these people doing really amazing world-class work that was affecting the lives of millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people. Mm. And I was looking for a book that spoke to us. And I saw lots of books for entrepreneurs. I love reading and I tend to do a lot of it. And I was like, these are great. I like them. I value them. I'm learning from them. But they aren't exactly speaking to a person who's in that role. And then I looked at books for CEOs and CMOs and CTOs and CIOs and whatnot. Like, those are great. Like them. Jim Collins' work comes to mind, for example. Mm, Yes. And it's amazing stuff. But where is the playbook? And I didn't find it. And so as I was taking several months, stepping back and planning to go find another role with a talented team to go build a business, I started thinking, hey, if it isn't there, maybe somebody should do it. Mm. And then a little while after that kind of growing thinking, the thought came to mind and it was a question, when's a better time? Ah. And that was the moment that things changed. And I committed and I said, I'm going to write this book. There were several 
things that needed to happen after that. One was I needed to learn how to write a book. <laughs> and so thankfully, I had a lot of people who helped. And I spent a large portion of the last year putting together the Inside Innovator, a practical guide to entrepreneurship. It published in March. And I'm happy to say that it's been well received. Congratulations. It is a palpable gap in the universe of innovation, universe of leadership books, the universe of self-help books. And so I'm grateful that you stepped forward to fill it. It's a book that I could have used 20 years ago. Well, we'll see here. And, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention in the context of this question, from time to time, books have been published on the topic. There's one from 1985 called Entrepreneuring by Gifford Pinchot. It's an excellent book. I'd recommend it. And there are others along the way. And what I'm hoping to do is essentially to have a reference guide that helps a whole lot of people for our generation. Ah, that is a wonderful endeavor. And thank you for undertaking that. It's one of those things where I think it was Mark Twain said, I never let my schooling interfere with my education. And so it's one of those things where this is a distillation of that education that you can't get from schooling. And I think those are important things to codify today. So I really am grateful that you took a lived experience in these corporations that only a select few people get to have and codified that and pulled the lessons out of it and made it available to the world. That's really important work. Well, thank you, Jared. I agree. And to the extent that there's value in the book, it's because of essentially the network effect. I've been so fortunate to work with amazing people over the years. I've worked in environments and the Weather Channel comes to mind in particular as a place where that's a company that was an entrepreneurial venture. It started with a TV network and then ah. it developed into a website for desktops and it developed a mobile generation. And if you go back before that, you find a cable company. And if you go back before that, a newspaper company. Right. And so I just want to express appreciation to the mentors that I've had and the people who created environments where a bunch of us could work together and hopefully create some interesting products and services and help some folks along the way. That's what it's all about, right? Taking what you've been given and paying it forward. I love that. How much time, if we can kind of shift gears a bit, I'm thinking about time horizons. You mentioned time horizons before and how things are being compressed relative to sort of the arc, the time horizons that we've seen in the past. How much time does it take to really sort of wrap your head around this concept of I'm in this job, I'm an entrepreneur? What kind of roles, what are the signals or experiences that might help you recognize yourself as an entrepreneur, if that makes sense? Jared, when you're asking that, are you thinking more about kind of knowing yourself or are you asking more about being in a situation inside an organization and saying, oh, this looks like a chance to put on my entrepreneur cake? <laughs> I think something in between the two. So if I'm in a role where I'm trying to be entrepreneurial inside a company, how do I identify that in myself? Like, oh, I like solving these types of problems. And then how do I go find that opportunity within that company? Does that make more sense? Yep. It makes a lot of sense and it definitely helps. So I'll take those in order. First, I advocate self-knowledge and as much as possible, as early as possible, because that helps with the time frames and it helps with the increased probability that you're going to be in a place where you're effective and fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And there are very few things that replace a learning mindset and starting with yourself and also expanding to the world around. And there are some specific diagnostics, whether it's a Myers-Briggs or a Berkman or you know several others that do the job on that. Mm -hmm. And so you can get well-tested insights into what makes you really groove, what helps you to be in a place of flow, what helps you to be uplifting to those around you, and more. Hmm. And then secondly, when you get into a role, you can pay attention yeah. and see what works. Hey, does this come naturally to me? Is building bridges something that comes naturally to me? Do I feel like I'm curious? By the way, there are five characteristics of entrepreneurs that came out most prominently in my research. There are a total of 16, but five of them. And the first one is curiosity. The second one is action orientation. The third one is the ability to build bridges. The fourth one 
is risk tolerance. And then when I'm not trying to think about it, I'll think about that fifth one. And I'll try to come back around to it. <laughs> of course, of course. But it's a set of characteristics that help distinguish entrepreneurs. If you know that, you can recognize the place you're in. And then secondly, when you're in a role, you start looking for things like, is this organization receptive to change? Mm. Is this time good for change? Do I see some opportunities that are right in front of us? Do we need to look further afield? Do we have a team that needs some assistance? Do I have an advocate in my boss and many other things? So you can start to look around. I go into a lot more detail about this in the book, but that's a starting place. Mm -hmm. That's super helpful. I was hopeful that that was part of the way you view things. And that is, I think, going to be very useful to people because to my mind, there are a couple different types of books in this space. Most of them are case study example, pull the insights out kind of books. And those are interesting and entertaining. And I think in this space, there are also books that take that next step to say, okay, now this is how it can practically be applied in your day-to-day -day work. And so I'm excited to hear that that's something that not only you thought about, but have included in the book. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate that. And the goal was to make this very applied mm -hmm. so that someone who reads this, they can find nuggets that work for them if they're interested in the topic. By the way, uh, since I created Suspense, I want to deliver. So the fifth one is optimistic. Uh, or optimism. Optimistic, yes. And it's very important. And what I talk about there is grounded optimism, because it's not just expecting everything to turn out roses. It's being very pragmatic, very practical, and saying, hey, how can we best contribute? There's a service mindset, but at the same time, keeping in mind the goal. Mm -hmm. And even when you have the inevitable twists and turns and ups and downs that come along with it, you know where you're going and you keep working towards a way to get there in a way that meets your objectives, that supports the company and lifts people up. Mm, so important. So important. The combination of optimism and curiosity, I think, is very important because one without the other can be a problem. If you're optimistic and are fine with what you currently know, you're going to miss something. And if you're curious but not optimistic, you're probably going to find more evidence for why something can't happen than why it potentially could. I completely agree with you. And in fact, what I found is that I have not yet discovered an example of a really effective entrepreneur who didn't have all five of those characteristics in large quantities. Mm. So that goes back to your question. Hey, how do you know if this might work for you? If you feel comfortable with those five characteristics, then maybe this works well for you. Another thing I want to say, there's no value judgment here. There's no value judgment about entrepreneurs versus entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. If you're a person, if you get a lot of satisfaction out of making the trains run on time, that's great. Mm -hmm. We need the trains to run on time. Yeah, that's right. By the way, if you can help us figure out a way for the mail to be delivered consistently, let me know because we need that <laughs> these days. It's really important. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And at the same time, if you want to be an entrepreneur, there are proven ways to increase the likelihood that you'll be successful and happy. Louis, this has been an energizing and educational conversation. I'm so glad you took the time to join us. Before I let you go, I have to ask if you have any advice for innovators out there. I do. And as you might imagine, and I think this is the case for a lot of your guests, I have a lot of things, but I have four to share today. Oh, wonderful. The first one, and this is one of the most important, have a learning mindset. Mm. Just coming in, be open-minded and ready to listen and learn as you go. It's very difficult to innovate if you don't have that. The second one is watch for waves. In the area you're in, watch for major changes in the landscape where you can participate. I feel so fortunate that I arrived at the Weather Channel before the wave really hit for mobile. Mm. But I was in a position with a team that was convinced that we were onto something and that we could serve our customers. That turned out to be right. And so we went from being really a rounding error in the value proposition of the Weather Channel for customers and the revenue to being a primary value driver of growth over a period of years. It doesn't happen overnight in most cases, right? but it happens over time when you catch the wave. Another one is at a certain point, you just get started. 
I don't know about you. I do know some about me and some others that I'm familiar with. And that is we have such high standards and high expectations and we want to do well. And sometimes it's easy to defer for a while when you can at least get started with some ideas, even if they're little baby steps. Right. And so I think for many of us, especially once we're convinced that we're going in the right directions, take a few steps, see how it goes. Sometimes the iteration pays off. In fact, often it does. And then last one is recognize the value of the team. In innovation, every now and again, somebody can do a large portion of what they need to do on their own. But in my experience, most of the time, it's because you have different people with different skill sets who look at the world in different ways and with different backgrounds. And these differences should be highly valued, especially if you create an environment. I suppose this is four and a half or five. But if you approach this with something that I refer to in the book as the round table visual, where everybody you have, imagine a round table, there's no hierarchy. You're just coming and you want people to bring themselves and what they see so that you can create a great outcome and hopefully have a really interesting journey along the way. Mm -hmm. That seems like a pretty great approach to me and I've seen it work. That sounds like a fantastic approach to me. I love the round table metaphor, so I'm glad you threw that half in there. Thank you. Looking for the waves is something I will take with me right out of this call. Spend some time with the whiteboard thinking about, okay, well, what waves might I be seeing but not seeing? Yes. And so thank you for those. Lewis Gump, author of The Inside Innovator. Thank you so much for your time. And this conversation has been fantastic. And I hope we can stay connected. I've really enjoyed it, Jared. Thanks for having me on your show. All right. Take care. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform to get more insights from innovators across the world. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional content and conversation. I hope to see you there. Until next time. Keep innovating, whatever that means.